All right, should be live right now. Hopefully everyone's having a good time. Uh, I think I've, I think I've shielded the stream enough, but uh, all right, let's see. See if enough people are gonna join. So today, today's topic, as you can see in the thumbnail, in the title, etc., is going to be on the Virgin Mary why do we call her the mother of God? What's the point? Why does it matter that she is perpetually virgin? Um, is she immaculately conceived? Why do we even need to, you know, ask for her intercessions? As uh, in general, what's the point of asking for intercessions in general? Right? There doesn't seem to be any point. You see the kind of there's a kind of like a popular Protestant argument that goes something like. Um, you know, why do we give honor to created human beings when all honor is due to God? And someone is screaming outside as if they're getting knifed. But it's a great neighborhood. Something like that is not happening, but it's just that, I don't know, maybe it's just a dog barking. I'm pretty sure I closed the windows, but whatever. Uh, if it gets too annoying, I'll probably look into it. But... That's what the general questions are going to be. And again, my analysis generally tends to be, okay, we can look at scripture, etc. We're going to do that. But I like to focus more so on how we read it, right? So what are the theological consequences of some of these beliefs? Uh, because on the face of it, for example, mother of God, it's, it does seem, okay, it seems like it can, you know, Christ is God. So it sounds like it is correct in, in a sense, but also... You know, wouldn't it mean that the, the, she's the mother of the Trinity, which is obviously ridiculous. No one believes that. So why should we even use a risky term like this and just not instead opt for a safe term, right? Um, on the face of it, this seems quite reasonable. But if you look into the history and if you look into the theology behind the term, the scriptural base of that term, what tradition says regarding it, you will realize suddenly, okay, it's not as simple as I thought. Or something like perpetual virginity. What's the point of vir Mary being a virgin? Oh, it's probably because Christians are sex-deprived cultists and this total bullshit nonsense. But it's not. It has nothing to do with how evil sex is or anything like that. It has to do, do with something greater than that, right? Something that kind of transcends that kind of material, lovely topic. Um, on the other hand, we got to also avoid excesses, right? So what kind of excesses? Well, I mean, obviously the excess of, you know, there's very few people, very, very, very few people who outright say that Mary is God, which is just totally heretical. To, like, it's, not, it's blasphemy. It's blasphemy of, you know, a very high tier, one of the highest tiers, basically. It's shirk, you know, you can't, you can't do that. You can't commit that. Very few, very, very, very tiny amount of people believe that and they're, you know, Everyone believes, everyone can believe anything, right? So that's kind of just, you got to have to accept that about reality. But uh, I forgot to, I actually forgot to ping my own server. <laughs> I pinged all of these different servers, but I forgot to ping my own server. Uh, streaming right now. All right. What was I saying? So anyways, these kinds of questions, etc., are natural. But if you're just going to, you know, sit and don't do any research, don't look into the history, don't ask yourself questions why these things matter, then, you know, you're not going to find any answer to anything, right? Because one thing you're going to realize is that although Orthodox theology is for everyone, it requires hard work, right? Just like praying is for everyone, but it requires hard work to do it at a less than, you know, a... a you know, more than adequate level, right? It requires a lot of effort. It requires a lot of reading, a lot of research, a lot of understanding life and experiences and things like that. Same, t it's, you know, theology is the same because theology is the same as prayer anyway, right? It's just, you know, there's distinctions between the two. You can speak of that. I already have a video talking about that. But anyways, I want to start with, Instead of starting with the Virgin Mary, however, I'm going to start with the idea of venerating saints because, uh, you you know, someone might watch this video and be totally convinced of every single argument that I provide, 
they might say, okay, oh, this sounds like a very reasonable argument. This, this is an excellent argument. I totally agree with this. And then still come up and say, well, I just don't see why we should ask for her intercessions. What's the point, right? Um, and you guys say this, this, this about Mary. And I don't like that, you know? Why are you saying these kinds of things? So I might still come up with that. So kind of as a pre-introduction, I think we can talk a little bit about veneration of saints. Not too much. But I want to start by quoting a tweet of mine that I made. Um, hopefully, I can find it. But it's quite a it's quite a recent tweet. I'm not going to show the tweet. But actually, I probably should show the tweet. Because it is quite useful. Um, let's see. All right. I think... Yeah. So... Oh, you can you can see the you can see the Turkish trends. Oh no. Anyways, so the the question I, I'm kind of responding to here to kind of give you the context is well, what's the point of venerating holy people? Okay, I understand they're holy and and all this kind of stuff, but why do we ask for their prayers? Why do we pray to them? Even if they understand that you know praying to someone means asking to someone, right? It has that kind of a meaning. I understand all of that, someone might say. But still, what's the point? Because aren't we giving the glory that is supposed to be given to God to just mere men, even if they are saved? And to kind of understand this topic, you need to kind of understand or have a basic understanding of the essence energies distinction. And there are two videos I talk about this. One is an introduction to essence energies distinction as I made. It's also one of my popular videos. But a less popular, and I think just as important, is essence energies distinction in the Bible. And this might be shocking to some people, but this orthodox concept is actually very clearly in Scripture. And I don't mean it in the sense that, oh, this can only logically be explained by... No, the, the, the term is literally used. The term that is used in the patristic context, even by St. Gregory of Palamas, who is considered late. But it, you know, we can talk about... You know, St. John of Damascus, St. Maximus the Confessor, St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory the Theologian, the way they use it lines up with the scriptural way that is being used. And it certainly is very different from um, how Roman Catholics and Protestants viewed this, right? Viewed this thing. So if you kind of had that background, it's going to be very easy for you to understand. If you don't, it might be a little difficult, but bear with me here. So the argument that I'm using here is that since the saints partake in God's glory, see 2 Peter 1, 4, where he says, you know, we are to become partakers of the divine nature. And now when we talk about partakers of the divine nature, does it mean that we partake in God's super essential divinity? No, that is that is only partaken by the Son and the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm not including the thought because when we speak of God's super essential divinity, you know, divinity, the God, the term God here usually refers to the Father, right? So, you know, only the Father, Son, Holy Spirit share in that. Um, so, what is being partaken of then is God's nature in the sense of God's energies, right? We can talk, we can see whether they are attributes, whether they are called energies, whether they are called the things around God, you know, which some fathers use that kind of terminology really doesn't or where we call them divine processions right they're different saints that use different kinds of names for this thing but really especially as you see in saint gregory palamas um all, the, those terms pretty much mean the same thing and it's not just saint gregory palamas that's saint mark of ephesus and other saints as well and even you know pre-schism saints also kind of use that for so, so for example if you read saint john damascus's exposition of the orthodox faith um he pretty much you know makes that connection there too even mm -hmm. Shaf, if even, you know, Shaf, who translates, you know, who's the translator of it, um, or the publisher, <laughs> even he admits, yes, there is a connection between them, right? But Dr. Dave Bradshaw is the one who really obviously makes that connection too. But anyways, um, when, we, when the saints partake in God nature, what is being partaken of is then the energies, right? And so one of them is God's glory. Right. So and since God's glory is undivided. So think of it in the sense of the Trinity. Right. So, for example, we worship the Father uh, in the Holy Spirit through the Son. Right. That's a that's a common formula, Trinitarian formula. So you worship the Son 
And the father, you know, the son being an icon, an express image of the father, as St. Paul says in Hebrews 1.3, that glory is not undivided. It passes on to the prototype, right? So the son is a type of the father, whereas the father is the prototype, but they are a natural icon. So the son is a natural icon of the father. This means that they share the same nature. So the glory is not divided. The glory is undivided. The glory that is given to the son is given to the father also, is also you know, in the Holy Spirit too. So that kind of logic kind of applies to saints. It's just in a different way, right? So what is shared by the Trinity by nature is given to the saints by grace. Now, grace is an energy, and as St. Athanasius says in his arguments against Arians, um, and I talk, this, talk about this extensively in videos um, relating to the filioque, in fact, um, St. Athanasius makes a distinction, and St. Kirill of Alexandria too makes this distinction, between uh, what is internal to God right, which is the the power of nature, right, so generating, right, so generating a divine person is internal to God, that is, it's of the same essence, whereas what is by God's will or by God's energy, actually you can say and to that, God's will and energy, right, so St. Athanasius uses the term will, um, St. Kirill of Alexandria uses the term energy to make this point, what is by God's will and energy is external to him, right, so the saints that participate in God's nature, according to grace, are external to God. That is, they're not of the same essence, but they are part still partaking of his energy. So God's glory is shared by his saints. And God, as scripture says in 2 Thessalonians 1.10, and this is St. John Chrysostom's um, reading of this passage, uh, God is glorified in his saints because God's glory is in his saints. That's the reason why venerating saints, in fact, does not take away the glory of God. It's, in fact, glorifying God himself. Um, and I make this make that point here as well. So that's that's the tweet I wanted to show. Um, St. John Christian pretty much says very similar things, if not the very same thing that, I'm, that I just said here right now. So this is why venerating the saints, for example, is not taking away glory from God, right? Uh, it's, in fact, recognizing the glory of God in holy men. And, you know, it's not just saints that were venerated. It's their relics. You know, the bones of Elijah um, is, a, is a miracle-working relic. The, the staff of Moses is a miracle-working, you know, relic. You can, you can see it as such because God's powers have worked through those things. Or the burning bush, right? Still to this day, the burning bush um, is still a place of veneration. You might be surprised. But the burning bush is still, you know, it's it still exists. Um, burning bush. I think it was it. Where is where is this? Uh, okay. So the burning bush, which is uh, in the chapel of yeah, there's a chapel of the burning bush at Mount Sinai. So this image here. It still exists here, this will be considered as a relic, right? And so some people, you know, naturally believe since God's power worked through there, it didn't just vanish and disappear, right? It's still a special place, right? Same thing with, you know, the saints themselves. God's power worked through them. They are deified. They participate in the glory of God. And so um, recognizing them is, in fact, the op you know, it's the opposite. Not recognizing them is not recognizing the glory of God. So when you kind of flip the switch in that sense, it becomes, in my opinion, much clearer um, why it's in fact important. Uh, and you know, we can even we can even talk about how even in the Old Testament, there has been uh, what was it? What was it? What was the exact term? You know, uh, prophets interceding. Um, Abraham's intercession of Lot is an example, right? In uh, you know, starting from Genesis 18, I think this was Genesis 19 exactly. Genesis 18 is when the when the angels visited. Um, Abraham intercedes, right? And do you think Abraham stops interceding when he went to rest? Obviously not, right? So we need to understand. Then this is another kind of problem with this that some people have is. Well, these are just dead men. These are just dead people. First of all, 
No one is dead in Christ. Are you saying that these people who are resting in Christ, you're saying they're dead? But what they really mean is that they want they say, oh no, their their soul is just sleeping. So it's the heresy of soul sleep. And why is soul sleep a heresy? Why is it a problem? Well, it, well, we need. To, and Saint John Cassian has arguments regarding this in his conferences. If you want to read kind of Eastern, um, Eastern monasticism that it, that was sent to West in the fifth century. So a lot of what Saint John Cassian is saying in his conferences and institutes predates Saint John Cassian. He's just you know giving what the Egyptians primarily did in their monasticism to the West. He's saying, do the same things as these people are doing. This is why the uh, Father Seraphim Rose, for example, talks a lot about Western saints like St. Benedict, St. Gregory of Tours, St. Gregory the Great. He, for These saints are very important for Father Seraphim Rose because they are carrying Eastern monasticism in the West, right? And he kind of makes the point that, well, these people are not remembered in the West anymore. The West doesn't care about these people as much as they care about some of the other saints that are more contemporary and why is that the case right and he kind of part of the reason he explains is because well these were eastern monastics in the west he doesn't say it exactly the way i say it he used more west friendly language but if you read his vita patrum which is the life of the saints that were written by saint gregory of tours he talks um the first 180 uh, pages of the book i think is just like giving a massive history of orthodox goal in the sixth century so some people for example will say oh so you're saying the West was Orthodox in the 6th century? Yeah, I mean, so if, if you say no, then we're just forfeiting the the fact that we are the church of the 1st century, right? So obviously we're not going to forfeit, forfeit that. Obviously not, we're not going to say, no, we aren't actually. No, we are, right? But we're going to get back to point on St. John Cassian. Again, St. John Cassian has various different arguments he uses. One of the arguments he uses regarding... Uh, again, soul sleep is pretty much, well, think of the soul, right? Like what What is the soul? Isn't the soul what gives life to the body? I mean, th this is literally in Old Testament, it's literally in Genesis. Like the first, it's literally in the first chapters of Genesis. It's in Genesis. And what does the soul do? It gives life to the body. The body becomes a living soul that is it becomes united with the soul and it gains life to the soul. So we can understand, okay, the body is sleeping. But to say that the soul is also sleeping, like the body is, is pretty much denying that the soul gives life. The soul doesn't just give life to the body. It's where the life of a man exists. Okay? Uh, this doesn't mean that the soul is a person or anything like that. So Apollinaris is still wrong. It just means that when the soul is united to the body, the soul, you know gains the things that are the that are the bodies and the body gains the things that are soul so the body gains life from the soul so when the body is when the soul is separate from the body and it's taken to christ it's going to be asleep i mean that pretty much denies the characteristics of the soul and again this is scriptural it's denying scripture it's denying the constitution of man so soul sleep is an unacceptable heresy but that's also the only way you can use as an argument to deny that the saints are living in Christ. Aside from the fact that, again, this crazy idea that the saints in Christ are dead, right? So, you know, no, but death is a result of sin, right? Death is a result of sin. And it's an opposite. It's also, you know, sin makes us opposed to God. This is why the crucifixion is so important, right? And why the resurrection is very very important is because christ is the only human being that actually you know died and destroyed death right we can't do that death takes us over because of sin but christ who knew no sin you know took on sin he became a curse that is he didn't become cursed he didn't become a sinner because he never committed sin rather that he became a curse in the sense that he took on death in his body uh, remember for example um the stuff uh of moses it's turned into a snake the snake is a symbol of death similarly christ's body turned into a snake in the sense that he he died in his body his soul went to hades but just like he you know a dark cave gets filled with light christ descended into hades again saint peter talks about this in his epistle and saved those who received and accepted the gospel of christ and then he resurrected afterwards right so saturday is his preaching of 
uh, of the gospel to the dead. So again, that presupposes that the souls of those people were still in, they, they were not in a soul sleep. He preached the gospel to what? Dead people? To people who are asleep, who can't listen? Obviously, no. So if they can receive Christ and listen to Christ, then they can receive and listen to our petitions of them. And since these people are holy, and as old, the Old Testament shows, God does listen to holy people interceding for sinful people. So the same principle is applied to the saints. We ask for their intercessions, not because they had the power to change us, but rather by their intercessions, they might convince God to have mercy on us. This is why asking for their inter intercession is very important. And this gets into the Virgin Mary because the Virgin Mary is the highest of all creation, even higher than the cherubim and the seraphim, as the liturgy says, not because she's higher than them by nature, but because she bore God in her womb and was purified and had God's, you know, God's presence in his human body and soul inside her womb for nine months and that purified her of sin and in the father's regular talk about either that the virgin mary was cleansed at the annunciation or she was cleansed in the conception of christ so uh, this kind of gets into the immaculate conception topic as well uh, some people might say oh but there are uh, eastern fathers that support immaculate conception i will recommend them to read craig truglius articles on this topic because he's the one who mainly deals with this it's pretty clear that the that they don't okay usually those arguments are just quote minds taken out of context that's not the style of what we're trying to do here right that's just not the style of a christian a christian does not try to make arguments just by oh this so and so said this quote right we we look at the whole systems and when you look at the whole systems of for example saint gregory palamas i mean there are people that say saint gregory palamas believe in the immaculate conception just it's totally ridiculous Based on a total lie, uh, Craig does a very good job exposing that. So I recommend you check it, check his content out for that topic, particularly. Um, but to kind of get back, get to the point of the Virgin Mary is that she's the highest of all creation, higher than the cherubim and the seraphim. Um, and so the reason why she is very important in Christianity is because of that, right? She has a personal relationship with Emmanuel, right? Uh, that is the God who is among us. And don't make this a meme among us joke. I beg of you, you know what I mean, okay? Um, he was with us and he was born of the Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit, as the creed says. So this is why she is important, right? So we can, for example, ask petitions from Abraham or from Moses or from Jacob, right? But the petitions from the Virgin Mary are the most important. And the wedding at Cana illustrates this because the first miracle was done by Christ due to a petition from his mother. So this is a very important point. And the fact that John is making that point, I think is more important because it was John who, you know, Christ uh, gave the responsibility of Virgin Mary to. So out of all of the apostles speaking about this topic, I think John speaking about this makes the most sense. And gives the most power to this kind of argument, right? So before we kind of get into the questions then, we kind of explained the veneration of saints at least a little bit, right? Again, um, there are scriptural arguments that I can also use, but I think there are a lot of people that focus on that. And, you know, for example, Seraphim Hamilton does that. You know, he takes a more scriptural approach to this. My approach is kind of the more logical, theological, patristic philosophy based, right? Which is kind of just... You know, this is what the soul is. This is what the argument leads to, etc. I think that's a that's a, in my opinion, a stronger form of argument that was more convincing to me, because I think a lot of people are not good, like because the problem with just citing Bible verses is that I think it's better to read the Bible as a whole instead of just like dividing them into these different verses. This verse proves this. This verse proves that. I don't like that. That's not an approach that personally convinced me. I know it convinces people. It doesn't convince me. I don't think it works that well. I think by the Bible is much better than taken as a whole. So my approach is generally, again, is, okay, this doctrine, does it have patristic support? Does it have biblical support? Does it, you know, can in what logical sense can it be explained? What does it lead to? And the thing that it leads to, is it a, is it a problematic thing or is it something good? Right? Is it something desirable? That's, the, that's my personal approach. 
But before I get into some of the questions regarding perpetual virginity, um, I want to kind of just give you a very brief rundown of what the Orthodox doctrine of the Virgin Mary is, right? So I kind of already gave some hints to it. She's the highest of all creation. Uh, she is the she is the mother of Christ. We call her the mother of God because although she gave uh, she didn't give birth to Christ's divinity, she gave birth to Christ's humanity. So Christ Christ was born of the Father in His divinity, but in His hu humanity, He was born of the Virgin Mary, right? So. Um, we still use the term mother of God because Christ himself is God. And I think Luke 1, um, Elizabeth uses the term mother of my Lord. And I think this is a very important term because Lord in the Christian worldview is a divine title. It's not a mere human, especially applied to Christ. It's not a mere human title. It's a divine title, right? So if we can apply, so if we can say mother of my, you know, your mother of insert divine title, then there is really no logical reason why we can't just say mother of God, right? And the basic argument, which is just like a very, you know, simple, basic argument. If the Virgin Mary is not mother of God, then Christ is not God. But it's a very effective argument because we're going to be talking about Nestorius next and um, why that part of history matters a lot. But before we get into that again, this is why we refer to her as, uh, as the mother of God. Um, she is also a perfect example of how anyone should, not just the example of how a woman should act, she's really an example of how anyone should act uh, in her life. Um, she's perpetually virgin because she was purified by giving birth to Christ and she lived the highest spiritual life that she could live while also being sinless. But we also need to make a crucial detail here, and this relates to the Immaculate Conception, is that although we believe she was sinless, she still fell asleep in the Lord. So, for example, in August 15th, um, we celebrate the Dormition. But we also celebrate the Assumption, right? So, the Roman Catholic Church, for example, only celebrates the Assumption because, you know, death comes through sin, right? So, someone who is sinless by nature, which, in the Roman Catholic view, the Virgin Mary was conceived immaculately. That means she had no original sin. Right, we believe that she did have original sin, but she did not commit a sin. So we make a distinction between original sin and the guilt inherited, if it is inherited at all. Right, we don't believe in inherited guilt. Now Roman Catholics don't do it anymore. Uh, I believe that they kind of historically went to that direction. That's a, that's a whole pack of worms by itself. But um, what was I what was I going to say? So. We believe that she still had original sin. That's why she fell asleep. But she was also assumed, that is, she was resurrected, right? So we believe in the Dormition and we also believe in the Assumption. Um, so that's another point that I will make. And traditionally speaking, the perpetual virginity of, the, of Mary, you know, this was not questioned historically. Even the Protestant reformers didn't question this, right? They didn't question Mother of God. They didn't question the perpetual virginity. They didn't question these topics really until after the Protestant Reformation. And there's a very good reason why. It's because the Protestant Reformation was a reformation, that is a revolution, against tradition itself. But really this started from Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. That's why the Reformation happened in the Roman Catholic West and not in the Orthodox East. And you can say, oh, you guys, you guys got conquered by the Turks, okay, Russia. So why was there no reformation in Russia? Oh, because Russia was backwards, right? That's what these people will say. Russia was backwards. They were just a, they were just not an advanced civilization like us Westerners have. But then these same people will at the same time, oh, all heresies, the heresies came from the East. Well, yeah, that's because the East in the pre-schism was way more advanced than the West. And that brought in a lot of good things. Like the fact that all the ecumenical councils, until somehow the Pope could decide to call ecumenical councils, right? Which is in the 12th century. Until at that time, all the ecumenical councils were in the East. All the main theological contributions came from the East, right? The responses to heresies all came from the East. The most the West did is just kind of like, yeah, we agree with this Eastern guy. Yeah, we agree with that Eastern guy. That's the most <laughs> the West did historically. And this is not some... I'm not trying to be an Eastern chauvinist or anything like that. I'm just saying that... 
I'm just kind of pointing out the hypocrisy. But, you know, most people don't really care about hypocrisy now, do they? If they did, <laughs> you know, it will work politically at least, right? But th still, to make the point, you know, this kind of questioning of tradition is really a product of Protestantism. And this kind of begs the question, then you can question your own belief system. And when I say question, I don't mean in the sense of allowing doubts to like be defeated by faith and reason. I'm not saying it in that sense. I think that's a good kind of doubt because it means that you're, you want to know more about your faith. Right. So that's the motivation for you to learn more. I think that's a great thing, actually. I know some people think it's a bad thing that we need to have a baby like faith. I agree with that. I agree that we need to have a baby like faith. But I also think that if you're going to be, you know, reasonable beings, we kind of have to have a reason to ask ourselves, OK, why do we believe this? And I think that's a perfectly fine thing. Right. But. What I am talking about in terms of doubt is kind of just, well, did Moses exist, right? Questioning things that really shouldn't be questioned because, for example, well, if you believe God exists, right? And if you believe that God preserved the scriptures and preserved the revelation, certainly then, you know, when, when scripture talks about Moses and Abraham and all these people, obviously they probably do, you know, obviously they exist, Right? Because we believe that God has the power to preserve his revelation. <laughs> so there's no need to question it. It's like saying, okay, I believe in the Bible. I believe everything that the Bible says. I just don't think God exists. Like it, it will be, rid that's ridiculous, right? Well, saying that, you know, questioning the existence of Moses or questioning this event that happened in scripture, it's kind of the same kind of question now, isn't it? Right? It's pretty much the same logic. And I understand that there are some things that, you know, maybe copyist errors, some of the things like um, the title of a king is referred to in the personal name, right? That's a, that's a problem some people have with the book of Esther, I believe, right? Nebuchadnezzar, whereas he didn't exist at that time, but that's because Nebuchadnezzar was a name that was given to the title, you know, of that emperor. Anyways, that's, a, again, different kind of topic. The point that I'm trying to make here is that eventually just it spirals into a death spiral, right? And that's what it leads to, right? Or, or again, kind of like if you can question whether we should receive the creed as it is or whether we can make, you know, minor small additions to the creed, you know, if you're willing to accept that, then you should also be willing to accept a lot of these things as well, right? But we want to stick to patristic tradition. We want to stick to Christian tradition. And when we look at Christian tradition, no one really questioned, you know, very, 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 very few people questioned the, these things that they were heretics. And uh, St. Jerome, for example, has a writing against Helvidius, who, you know, questions some things about Mary, and he explains the doctrine very clearly, right? Um, and another book that I will recommend before I move on to the objections will be uh, The Orthodox Veneration of the Mother of God by um, St. John Maximovich, which I actually have a video on this very book, too. So if you want to read the book, I will recommend that first, right? But if you're the kind of a person who... You know, maybe I need someone to baby my butt through this book. You can watch my presentation on that book. It's like it's like an hour, right? But if you if you if you're a smart boy, you don't need any babying. You can read that book for yourself. I'm sure you're. It's a simple book. It's an easy to understand book. It's not it's not super difficult, right? So that kind of I think gets over the topic of Mary. But we also want to talk about the excesses, right? Again, immaculate conception, which will mean that Mary did not have original sin or ancestral sin, whatever you want to say. Well, what is the consequence of it, right? I mean, why do you even need immaculate conception, right? Um, is it really impossible for Mary to be sinless while also having original sin? Is that impossible? Um, if it's impossible, why is it impossible, right? Well, it's, if it's impossible, it's impossible because of inherited guilt, for example, right? That's a that's a way that you can think of it. Um, and we also don't want to go to the excesses of people like Maximilian Kolbe, who says that the, the Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit are in a kind of a quasi hypostatic union. I'm not kidding. That's an actual <laughs> that's an actual um view some people have within Roman Catholic Church. I, I'm not going to say that this is a super popular view or anything like that. I'm not going to say it's a dogmatic view. 
Um, but somehow there can be people with that kind of a view, right? So uh, I forgot to put the put the link. So uh, all right. Yeah, I don't trust these people, but that's a that's, that's a different topic. So I think that covers. Any, oh, and I also want to mention if you have any questions that you want to bring to me, whether it's about this topic or whether it's about a different topic, you can super chat. If you haven't, let me in fact look at. You know, uh, someone did in fact super chat, and it was Nectarius. So we, I'm going to I'm going to dealing with this before we get into the some of the objections. Nectarius gives me sends me. A four and a half British British pals. Oh mate, I can nearly buy a bottle of water with that. Thank you for the subscription, sir. I needed that money to buy a bottle of water. Buy a twelve bottle of water like this. And and he he says, Will you ever do a video on the wet and right? A lot of people in it are basically just syncretists. And to that, I will I will respond. Maybe my accent is crazy. I'm, I'm going to read it properly, okay? <laughs> enough, enough joking around. Will you ever do a video on West and Right? A lot of the people in it are basically just syncretists. I mean, I've made statements, but I've regarding it, I've expressed things that I don't like about it. It's just that, is it worth to make a video and just like attract the ire of... A lot of people because of that i think the risk reward is really not good and it's you can you can say well it's about truth and all this kind of stuff but i think a good way to combat the syncretist people in this in this group is instead of attacking the west and right i think we can kind of just say well this is what orthodox theology believes right and if you don't believe that you're not orthodox i think that's a better way to deal with these things um so i you know i have some people that like me in our west and right and I have some people that I like that are Western, right? But um, I think it is accepted. I think there are saints that supported it. I think there are also saints that questioned the way it was done. Um, that's usually most people don't talk about that, for example. But it's uh, I think it's not that big of a deal. It's a very, very, very small. I mean, people need to realize, right? They talk, Western right is an Internet thing. It's mostly an Internet thing. It exists in America. Yes, but it doesn't exist in France. It doesn't even exist in France. And you think it, it will exist out of all the countries it will exist. It will exist there. But it doesn't, right? Um, and in America, yeah, sure, it does exist. Is this open? Oh, there's some sunflower seeds I didn't eat. Well, I'm going to throw this in the trash because it's probably corrupt. But um, what was I going to say? Yeah, but it's such a minor part of the Orthodox world. That I think is severely overblown how much of an influence it has, how important it is, or anything like that. And I certainly don't think that most people are going to be, you know, there again, there are some people that go too overboard with syncretism and stuff like that. But even amongst the Western right, they're a minority from what I've seen at the very least. The online people, I think they're a different beast. Um, I think their problem isn't that they have a Western right, I think their problem is something else because I think that the, these people will probably. If they were in the Eastern, right, they will probably still be syncretistic, right? So that's kind of my take around it. Um, I always say this over and over when this topic comes into play. The Western, right, is not like the Byzantine Catholics. Because one of the things that we don't, that the Eastern Catholics do, is they venerate saints that the Roman Catholic communion rejects. We don't do that, right? There's, and the parishes that do do that in the Western, right, are very, a small amount of them. And what they are doing is actually recognized as something that is condemnable in the Orthodox Church. So that's, a, for example, a major difference between the two. Um, so uh, I think that's an important point to make. Anyways, having said that, uh, we can we can get into into what exactly. So let's talk about the term "Mother of God," right? Again. Why does it matter so much? Why is it so important? Um, and what I want to start with, first of all, the kind of patristic usage of the... First of all, there's a biblical usage of it, right? So I believe this is in Luke 1, 4, 9. 
45, uh, where Elizabeth tells Mary, nope, it's not 145, it's 140, it's 143 probably. Yes, Luke 143 is when Elizabeth says, and whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? So first of all, there is a very biblical basis of the term mother of God. It's in scripture, right? And again, you can say, well, it says Lord. It doesn't say God. Well, again, okay, the title Lord. Is it a divine title or a human title, right? Oh, she is it in a human sense. Oh, so, so you're now agreeing with the Unitarians and the Muslims and all of these different Christ-rejecting groups that Lord is a human title, right? Obviously not, right? If you're actually a Christian, you will agree that, yes, it is a divine title. So if you can say mother of divine title, mother of my Lord, right? Then what's stopping you from saying mother of God, right? It's pretty much the same kind of principle, the same kind of logic that is being used. So that's the first argument I will use, scripturally speaking. From the tradition standpoint, the earliest writings on this topic that we have is from the 4th century uh, St. Gregory the Theologian, in his five theological orations, refers to the Virgin Mary as the Mother of God. He used the term Theotokos. He refers to the Virgin Mary as the Mother of God. So that's the first time that's been... Not the first time, sorry. That's one of the first instances that we have of right now. And what I mean by that is that maybe there is evidence from the 3rd century or 2nd century. We just don't have that evidence right now because those writings might not be with us anymore, right? But we have from the 4th century, from the St. Gregory the Theologian, the term Theotokos. This was important and used against Nestorius in the 5th century. So from a traditional standpoint, this term has been used. But this term has been debated in the 5th century. So before we get into the 3rd Ecumenical Council of Ephesus in 431, we need to look at what happened prior to that. Because you can't understand the council if you don't understand what happened before the council. This is something a lot of people don't understand is that they think, people think that councils just happened because bishops were bored and said, let's make something dogma today, boys. Th that's not how they work, right? Ecumenical councils declare dogma. They don't, like, make a dogma. For example, the Trinity wasn't made a dogma in the first ecumenical council in Nicaea. It was dogma before that, right? It's just that it was a dogma that was questioned, and so the Council exists today for us to look back to and say, okay, this question was dealt with specifically, and these are the answers and arguments that they use that the church endorsed and received and accepted as arguments for the divinity of Christ, why we should believe in it, what kind of arguments we use, what kind of biblical passages we use to support this. All of them are in the history, part of the history of the first ecumenical council. That's how we, for example, understand it. So, uh, ecumenical councils aren't just you know bishops being born and saying let's make something dogma today. It's when something is they come from when something is being questioned. This is for example, some people say, oh, well, was there a council about dogmatizing X topic or Y topic or Z topic? It wasn't questioned historically, right? So why there will be no reason to make that a dog, you know, a debate? So you know, it's like, oh, uh, why is there no council on uh, you know, God the Father being God. Like, for example, it will, it will be ridiculous to have a council around that. So, we kind of need to understand from that perspective. Secondly, is we need to understand the Christological developments that were happening at the time. So, at the time of St. Gregory Theology, if you read his letters to Cladonius, even prior to, to that, there were some, you know, Saint, the letters to Cladonius is responding to two growing threats at the time, at the fourth century. One of them is Apollinarianism, which was uh, condemned in the Second Ecumenical Council. Apollinarianism is the belief that Christ did not have a rational human soul. Um, it also believed in different things, but that's like the main thing it was associated by. It because in Apollinarianism, Christ's rational soul was the person. So it confused an aspect of nature with person. Right. So that's w one of the mistakes of Apollinarianism. Uh, and that's why, you know, if... Christ has a complete, two complete natures for Apollinarius. This will mean Christ is two persons. On the other side, um, there were the, you know, there were people like Theodore of Tarsus, Theodore of Mopsuestia, you know, 
and these people were supporting a different kind of Christology that was responding to Apollinarius that had some beliefs that sounded quite strange to these people. So St. Gregory the Theologian in his letters to Cladonius is in fact refuting both of these groups, right? He's refuting Apollinarians, and one of the arguments he uses is that, well, if Christ didn't assume a human mind, then our human not mind is not healed, right? Because what is, what is not assumed has not been healed. Um, and if that's the case, well, that's an obvious um, problem regarding soteriology now, isn't it? It is. So, uh, my mind focused on something else, sorry. Uh, and the other group of people were the proto-Nestorians, right? Those people who went to the opposite route and said things like, you know, Christ assumed a man or that, you know, Christ is two hypostases or that is two persons. And this was first um, implied with Paul of Samosata, which is in the third century, who has been uh, declared as a heretic. And this is why this source was associated with Paul of Samosata, because people realized, wait, he's pretty much saying the same things as, as this guy said, right? Which is the idea that Christ didn't assume, you know, Christ... By assuming human nature, it means that Christ assumed a man. And doesn't this mean that he assumed a human person? And that he united with a human person? This is pretty much the heresy of Nestorianism. But is this a result of what Nestorians want to believe? Or is this a result of what their beliefs are? And once you understand that the way the church viewed these things as this is what this view results into. It becomes a lot more easily digestible to uh, understand some of these discussions. Because, for example, Nestorius will say that, well, if someone who's simple in faith refers to the Virgin Mary as Mother of God, okay, you know, that's not a big deal. It's just that I don't think we should use it because it's a, it's a suspicious term, you know. Uh, it, can, it can lead to meaning that the Virgin Mary is the Mother of the Trinity, which is obviously heretical and so he kind of made it made the advance that oh it seems like this kind of like has some pagan ideas behind it so this you know you see you hear some people you know when they attack christianity they they say things like oh you know it this is this pagan idea that pagan idea well nestor has made the same exact kind of arguments like oh this is this is from some pagan idea of the mother goddess nonsense but christians didn't think of it that way christians looked at that and looked at him and said this guy's stupid, right? Um, and if you want to get into the much more advanced and planned out way of understanding the discussion between St. Cyril of Alexandria, who defended the unity of Christ and defended the term Mother of God, and the stories, I would recommend reading Farjan Makakin's book, St. Cyril of Alexandria and the Christological Controversy. Uh, so the stories, especially when he became a patriarch of Constantinople, um, in one of his first sermons, he had a deacon of his made a speech and his deacon basically said, uh, cursed is anyone who refers to the Virgin Mary as the mother of God, right? So that's kind of like one of the things that he said. And a lot of Christians were obviously, you know, riled up by it, saying, what's going on? You know, this is, you know, we, we've been saying this for such a long time. Now we're questioning it. What's going on? And St. Cyril, especially, uh, he didn't just think, oh, that's strange. Why does he, you know, this is a disrespect towards Mary. What he had in mind is that, wait a second, if we take this to this to its logical conclusion, this is denying the oneness of Christ. This is den denying the unity of Christ's personhood. And so this resulted in him researching the fathers of his time, which showcases that at the time of the 5th century in Egypt, there was a consciousness regarding the tradition of the fathers as a, as a form of the tradition of God in opposition to traditions of men. So we need to understand that the, the term traditions of men, the men there refer to the nature of man that is, you know, corruptible, right? Because traditions of men is like, you know, a man can come up with some idea, it can be continued, but it's corruptible. It's not divine. It's not true. It's something that will vanish over time. That's what a tradition of man is. Whereas a tradition of God is, you know, never ending. It's, you know, it declares the truth. And it is, it has, in a sense, analogically speaking, divine characteristics in the sense that it will endure until the end and things like that, right? So we need to make that kind of distinction too. Uh, having said that, St. Cyril looked into 
patristic writings from the Cappadocians and other other fathers, and he started to write against Nestorius. So one of his works is called the Five Books Against Nestorius. He has three letters against Nestorius, um, particularly the second and the third letter were dogmatized in Ephesus and in Chalcedon, and he has the twelve anathemas against Nestorius. Um, he also has you know, many different writings, uh, especially after the Nestorian controversy. He wrote a book called That Christ is One, also known as The Unity of Christ, which is translated by Father John McGuckin, where he made various different arguments against Nestorianism. This was after Nestorius's condemnation, by the way, right? So he's responding to people who might still harbor Nestorius's beliefs, right? So mainly Theodoret of Cyrus um, and supporters of Theodor of Mopsus and Theodor of Tarsus which leads to another work of his, which is Against Theodore and Diodor. Uh, we have fragments of that work remaining today. As a matter of fact, um, uh, some of these relate to, again, all of these relate to the 12 anathemas that he makes against Nestorius, which again was received in Ephesus um, and was kind of reiterated in the Fifth Ecumenical Council too. So you will see then that the question of... Um, the Theotokos is a Christological question. It's not just a question about the status of the Virgin Mary. And the reason behind it, again, is the di dictum, if the Virgin Mary is not the mother of God, then Christ is not God, right? And Nestorius's main polemic is avoiding that, right? How can I reject the term mother of God while simultaneously, um, you know, declaring that Christ is God? And so he had a Christological system that did not depend on a hypostatic union or an inner union of two natures, but rather at the hypostasis, the person as the product, an external product of uh, the two natures uniting in one supposed hypostasis. But again, this was a problem for Nestorius because while he wants to defend the unity of Christ, he in many instances rejected it unwillingly by pretty much declaring, well, um, one, of the, one of the arguments he uses is that, for example, Christ is too prosopa. Another argument he used, it, made, is against you know, Christ as an infant. He said, I cannot worship as God a baby of three months old. Right? And this was uh, quoted in the Third Ecumenical Council as well. But a very basic scheme of Nestorius' theology is that, a, a, we need to understand the presuppos a presupposition of his is that no nature can exist without a hypostasis, right? And, and think of hypostasis as person, the who, the subject, the individual, and think of nature as the what. Well, if a nature cannot exist without a hypostasis, and if Christ is fully man and fully God, then part of being fully man is being a fully human person. And part of being fully God means a fully divine person. And so since Christ is fully man and fully God, then Christ is a human person and a divine person, right? And so he has kind of the scheme of uh, three categorizations of titles. Some of Christ's titles refer to his humanity only. Some of his titles refer to his divinity only. And some of the titles refer to both, right? So for example, Christ, refers to both. This is why Nestorius says, well, you can call her Christotokos. Because you see, Christ is both man and God. It ref you know, this title refers to his both natures. So if you want to kind of have that, if you had that inclination towards Virgin Mary, you can still call her Christotokos. And this was rejected. Not because saying that, that Mary is the mother of Christ is heretical. What is rejected as heretical is the system and the reasoning behind Nestorius's preference for that term. Right, so Nestorius could really never run away from the accusation of his system leading into two persons, two separate individuals. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, he will say, "Well, you know, uh, if you use the term God, that has to refer to the Trinity only. If you use the term man, that has to refer to human persons only." Right? Both of them can be applied to Christ. So, Christ is both a human person and divine person. But if Christ is both a human person and divine person, aren't there two Christs, right? And he says, no, there isn't, because Christ is prosopically united. In what manner is Christ united? For St. Kirill of Alexandria, Christ is hypostatic. The two natures of Christ are hypostatically united. That is, they are united in his person, 
in his person are united the two natures, right? So it's an internal kind of a union. The basis, the foundation of the unity of the two natures in Christ is the person of Christ. And this is why I've heard some people, for example, argue that, oh, the heart is the center of the unity of a person. To like defend sacred hearts. Like, the heck are you talking about, dude? Like no, no one believes that. No one believed that. And that's obviously not true. The, the center of the unity, you know, the, the, the center of unity in a person is the person itself, right? That's the foundation of union. So that's kind of like how hypostasis has been defined. In Leontes of Jerusalem, then you will see this definition, which is, you know, used, accepted by St. Justinian um, in the Fifth Council, which is that the, that the hypostasis is a, the hypostasis is self-subsisting, um, particular, in which where natures and their properties exist and are united and where the existence of natures or nature is observed in a unique mode of existence. So really what Leontes is doing is just explaining and expanding on the Cappadocian definition of person, which is mode of existence. He's just kind of um, advancing on that. And so the result of Nasurus's theology then is, for example, if you can't refer to the Virgin Mary as the mother of God, then you can't say that God was crucified on the cross. And this is referred to the Theopascite controversy, right? So uh, Nestorius and his partisans rejected that too. So they denied, for example, that you can, you know, you can't say that God suffered on the cross for the same exact reasons. And this is very relevant to Protestantism because the center of Protestant soteriology is that God suffered on the cross in his humanity. But if you want to use the same logic as Nestorius uses to reject the term mother of God, the rejection of the term mother of God and the rejection of God's suffering on the cross is the same logic, is the same exact logic. So if you reject the term mother of God, you reject the crucifixion, right? And another argument St. Kirill of Alexander uses is the Eucharist, right? I mean, are we consuming Christ or are we consuming a human person? Right? Like what are we consuming? Our body, the body and blood of Christ? Is that is it a body of blood of the incarnate Lord? Or is it the a body and blood of some random human person? Right? So these were some of the questions that were raised against the stories that were not answered, right? Um <clears throat> And then as, as time went on, even after the stories, there are some the stories, for example, they said, okay, mother of God is acceptable, but I don't agree that God was crucified on the cross, right? Well, but why do you not accept that, right? Um, well, that seems contradictory. But again, the historians try to subsist and exist in the church until they schismed away and formed their own church, which is referred to today as the Church of the East. Right, and the Church of the East is Nestorian. If you read their catechetical manuals, like uh, what was the name of it? I I remember quoting this in a video. Um, it's not Pachita, but it was in a in a Nestorian in a uh, catechetical manual of the Church of the East. And in fact, Kai pointed this out to me. Um, I'm gonna the Marganita, right? So. It was the Marganita. So the Marganita was is a catechetical manual of the Church of the East, and it pretty much says the exact same things Nestorius is saying, right? In fact, um, it pretty much defends Nestorius' theology. So his belief really didn't end. It ended in the Church, but historically speaking, it has been defended by a very min you know small minority of people. Um, and by the way, in this, from uh, the Syro Malabar Church and the Chaldean Catholic churches, which are in the Catholic communion, it's also defended by them, right? So even though they don't want to say, you know, Nestorius is a saint openly, although some of them do, right? Um, they still refer to Theodore of Mopsus and Theodore of Tarsus as, you know, uh, saints and fathers. But Theodore and Theodore were also rejected as heretical. Well, Theodore was condemned in the Fifth Council. Right, so you can see then that the rejection of the name Mother of God has a very huge history behind it. Even after that, you know, argument, even after that argument was done and finished, the traces of it still remained historically. So, when you read some Protestant scholars making this kind of argument, you will you will notice if you read some of the sources, works, and statements, you will see that some of the things 
that these people are saying sound very close to what the source is saying. And Perry Robinson does a great job illustrating this. Um, John Calvin, for example, a lot of things that he says sound very similar to what Nestorius says. Um, it seems like their their Christological bent is really to that direction, right? So you listen to Reformed theologians speak about Christology. First of all, you will notice that these people have no clue of what they're talking about. But secondly, you will you will realize this, they're not really saying orthodox things, right? In fact, they're saying things that St. Cyril of Alexandria will, will reject. And he's kind of understood in the Orthodox Church in the 3rd, 4th, and 5th councils as kind of the centerpiece of orthodox christology now this gets into a different topic about monophysitism that i'm just not going to get into in this video um and i think that pretty much covers the mother of god topic right again if you want a deeper presentation of why this matters i will recommend you check out father john mcclickin's book Pillow of alexander and the christological controversy right so secondly, let's talk about the perpetual virginity of Mary, right? So why does it matter that Mary was perpetually virgin? Well, we can turn the question on its head. Why does it matter that Christ was perpetually virgin? Aha, you see, there seems to be something about virginity that's special. In fact, St. Paul explicitly talks about this. In his epistles, he says that virginity is a higher state than marriage. And oh, uh, so many people get so mad about this discussion. It's actually freaking insane. And it, like, I'm not even talking about Protestants or Roman Catholics. I'm talking about Orthodox themselves. But it's literally dogma that, spiritually speaking, virginity is a higher path than marriage. Now, does this mean that marriage is evil? Well, if you believe that lesser goods are evil, then that's what your belief leads to. But... Marriage is still good. Marriage is still a good. It's still a good thing to pursue. It's just a lesser good. But it's still a good thing to pursue. You will still be able to go to heaven. Guess what? You'll still be able to go to heaven if you marry and you don't have to confess it as a sin. <laughs> you don't have to. But if you understand that the Virgin Mary led the highest kind of a life and that Christ led the highest kind of a life, spiritually speaking, then naturally speaking, the Virgin Mary is also going to be virgin, right? Perpetually. So it's not just going to stop when she gave birth to Christ. She's continuously going to be virgin. And why does it, why do we believe that Mary is going to live a high life? Well, because she bore <laughs> God the Word in her womb. That's why. Oh, and some people are going to say, oh, he is merely an instrument. He's merely an instrument, right? It doesn't matter. So this kind of an approach, I think, really treats her like a, forgive me for even associating Mary with this terminology, but a professional sex worker. That's, oh, uh, the, the mother that gave birth to Christ, just an instrument of God. Like, bro, people don't even say that to prostitutes. Like, what the heck are you saying? Like, you need to really check what you're saying. This is an insane thing to say. It's an insane argument to make. It's like, oh, we're all, we're all, we're all asses and we're all going to be ridden by God. No, this is not a biblical view. But another problem with this is that, well, every human being, well, even Christ, by that logic, becomes an instrument of God because doesn't Scripture say that all things were created through Christ? Yeah, sure, he's divine, but he's merely an instrument of God, dude. That logic leads you to Unitarianism, right? So reducing everything to just, oh, it's just a mere instrument, no. Now, if you believe that human will is not active and energized, if you believe it doesn't have any existence, then yeah, sure, all human beings become instruments. They either become instruments of evil or they become instruments of good. But imagine thinking that way. I mean, seriously, imagine having that kind of a mindset, thinking that human beings are just determined machines and God just controls everything right and somehow god wills the salvation of all but he condemns he creates people and they don't have free choice and he makes them do evil things and then he condemns them for doing evil things like okay like you have to be in this is a, such a genius view right like there's actually people on this earth that like unironically believe like defend this kind of a theology it's because 
But that's what the scriptures say. That's what the scriptures say. I, that's what I think the scripture says. Paul says that uh, we're all predestined, that we're predestined to salvation. That means we don't have any choice in this regard. So why do I have to think that your interpretation is correct? For example, I can say, well, that refers to the will of God. And the will of God desires to predestine us to salvation. But we still need to cooperate with that predestination, for example. And so for it to be complete, right? So it's not a rejection of predestination. It's the distinguishing between predestination and foreknowledge, which St. Maximus the Confessor, for example, talks about this distinction, right? Predestination regards the choices of God that will happen. Foreknowledge is about choices we make that are going to happen, right? So there's a distinction of two wills, just like there's a distinction of the two wills in Christ. So this contradicts the Sixth Ecumenical Council as well. But again, that's a different kind of topic. But if you believe that God is good and he doesn't know evil, well, really, you have to believe in universalism. But if you don't believe in universalism, then God condemns people who are really not that in it you know not like guilty in fact not guilty at all because guilt implies personal agency where do you get that from david ezekiel right ezekiel what does ezekiel say the the son you know uh you know he who sins shall die but the son it doesn't is not a sinner on the account of his father that's what ezekiel says so we don't really want to get into that kind of like a meme view, How, however popular that might, that meme view might be, that reprobate view might be, but we don't want to get into that too much. What we want to get into is pretty much saying that if, if the Virgin Mary led a sinless, perfect life, then it, that it's only natural that she's perpetually virgin. So then this gets into the question of the brothers of Christ. I mean, the fact that I'm even talking about this is absolutely crazy. I mean, how can you not understand that they might just be half brothers that are called brothers? We do it all the time. Everyone in this world refers to their half brothers as brothers and sisters. Heck, we sometimes refer to people who are not even our relatives as brothers and sisters regularly. And, you know, we do that this in the East, in Turkish culture, Greek culture, in the Middle Eastern culture. So imagine 2000 years ago, probably they do it way more. Right. Um, but, you know, Christ does have brothers, brothers from Joseph, <laughs> self brothers from Joseph, not from Mary. Right. This is why Mary, we regard to her as the unwedded bride. And this is a kind of a paradox in the sense of burning bush. Now, the burning bush, in fact, is a type of the Virgin Mary, right, because she bore without being consumed God in her womb. Just like that, the burning bush, you know, was consumed by fire. But at the same time, it wasn't, right? It was burning, but it wasn't consumed by fire. So it didn't disappear from the fire. So once you kind of understand this paradox, the same paradox applies to the Virgin Mary. And so the perpetual virginity of Mary matters because virginity is a higher state than marriage. And so if the Virgin Mary really was transformed by Christ's presence, hey, doesn't St. Paul tell us that we need to be witnesses of our baptism, the transformation of baptism? Uh, the Virgin Mary kind of went through something even greater than that, you know, in a sense, right? She gave birth to God the Word. So, uh, the point is, if that is just some mere event that doesn't invoke any change, then what does invoke change, really, right? So, for example, they talk about, oh, the Spirit in me, the Spirit in me has sanctified me, and blah, 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 blah. So, they talk, you, can, you can talk about the Spirit sanctifying you, but when both the Spirit and the Son sanctifies the Virgin Mary physically and spiritually, yeah, that's a nothing burger, right? That's a nothing burger. It doesn't really matter. Mm, no. I don't think that's a convincing kind of an argument. So you understand then that also um, remember that Christ is not referred to as a son of Mary, Christ is referred to as the son of Mary. That's another point to make as well. Uh, all right. And finally, uh, before we get into this, it's going to be about immaculate conception. I want to complete it with this. And so these are topics that I talked about in my stream on, not stream, video on St. John Maximum, which is book, the, Vener the Orthodox Veneration of the Mother of God. 
but these are you know these arguments that i made or you know wanted to point out are kind of the more christ focused arguments or christological uh, arguments so let me check uh let me check my let me check my lord chat in it i wonder what they're saying please use keyframe frequency blah 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 uh and um i was gonna say yeah so there was another i don't want to just answer this like i don't even want to answer it but it's it's um <laughs> i mean I, okay uh someone asked you said in a video that the divine nature is not shared but is it the trinity doesn't the trinity share the divine nature and he cites the book one of Saint the Saint John Damascus video. I actually answered that question in that video. So and I don't want to bring a precedent, but I'll 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 give I'll do one good thing for you if you're still watching. Um yes, only the Trinity shares the divine nature. That's I said this the the answer to this question in even in the stream too. There's a lot of things I say over and over again, so in different videos, so I, don't know, I just don't want to make bad practices a uh what is it called precedent right um but that's a, that's a different topic anyways let's talk about immaculate conception then okay so why should we reject the immaculate what's the problem with it you say the virgin mary was sinless you say that she led the perfect right and then you still say she has sin what are you talking about buddy so one thing I will note, I will recommend people, and this is going to be a very interesting kind of an argument, but I still haven't found anyone refuting me on this yet. So it seems like I'm on the right track. One argument I will use is actually take a look at the Chalcedonian Creed. Um, the Chalcedonian Creed, in fact, is kind of making an anti immaculate conception argument. Um, and the reason is, is going to be on the clause that Christ is consubstantial with us in his humanity except for sin now what does that refer to now it can refer to personal sin but again personal sin is hypostatic it's not something you can be consubstantial with right so for example it's like saying that my sin is consubstantial to your sin i mean in a sense it is but for example um let's say i commit the sin of being arrogant because i'm very confident and i think I'm a great guy, think I'm handsome, and everything I say is correct, and that you should always listen to everything that I say, etc., 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 you know, maybe I'm, I have the sin of arrogance, for the sake of it, an example. And you have the sin of mm, greediness. Let's say you're a greedy person. Are we sharing the same sin? No, obviously not, right? So sin is hypostatic. That is personal sin, personal guilt is hypostatic. But we do share sin in the sense that you know sin doesn't have existence it's like darkness it goes away when light approaches right um so sin doesn't have a substance an essence but we, i say it in the sense that you know our human nature is damaged by sin right our human nature is damaged by sin and so um we are consubstantial with each other in every regard, including sin, because we have original sin, which is inherited from Adam, right? So we inherit everything from Adam, but we don't inherit his hypostasis. So we don't inherit the sin that was committed by Adam. So for example, unbaptized infants that die, they're not guilty of sin, right? They are still, they still have original sin, but they're not guilty of sin. Therefore, they're not condemned to hell. And I know some people are going to say, oh, so-and-so counsel and so-and-so -so father said that babies are burning in hell. So God condemns innocent people to hell? Oh, no, he doesn't. Oh, so babies are innocent, right? No. How are babies not innocent? Because they have original sin. But I thought you said they, had, they didn't inherit Adam's guilt. Uh, I guess they do now, right? That's kind of what that logic leads to. So we don't, we don't accept that kind of a view. Uh, 
I personally, I think seeing Gregor Fnissa's approach is the smartest one. Uh, St. John Chrysostom also says something similar to this, but first of all, St. John Chrysostom says we baptize infants not because, um, you know, he doesn't say we baptize them because they're sinners. He says we baptize them to make them partakers of the life of Christ. But St. Gregor of Nyssa has a great answer to this question, and he basically says, you know, well, um, they are going to be in a state that is better than sinners, but lesser than the saints. And this kind of makes sense because, so our baby is going to be glorified in the same exact way saints are, who had to work and toil to be, you know, saved. No, but at the same time, they are innocent, right? So they're going to be in a, you know, in a state that is better than non-existence, but it's not going to be a theosis glorified experience. This goes to the babies of, you know, unbaptized infants of heathen parents or, or whatever, right? God has a plan to them. We kind of make that judgment. You know, the judgment is made by God. We just know that and trust God's decision in this regard. Anyways, um, this is, for example, one of the consequences of inherited sin. Another consequence is the necessity of immaculate conception. Because if Mary didn't, uh, didn't sin and didn't have any personal sin, then this means that she can't have original sin either if it includes inherited guilt. You see, so this kind of leads into a spiral of, you know, uh, in fact, I even have a post of this on, on Twitter, um, you know, inherited guilt, and then leads to immaculate conception, and then it leads to assumption without the dormition, then co-redemptrix, and then, you know, uh, Maximilian Kolbe saying that, uh, the Holy Spirit is uh, the Mary. Uh, there is a quasi hypostatic union of Mary and the Holy Spirit, or of Leonardo Boff's claim that Mary is to be hypostatic united to the third person of the Blessed Trinity. Right. <laughs> so it's a it's a slippery slope in that regard. And it's not a fallacious kind of a slippery slope either. Anyways, uh, what was I going to topic? So. This is why we don't believe in immaculate conception because we make a distinction between personal sin that is hypostatic and original sin that is a corruption of human nature. So this distinction is made because we distinguish between nature and person. And we also need to understand that the term used for fallen human nature and pre-fallen human nature does not indicate two different human natures. The human nature is the same. Pre-fallen human nature refers to the human nature, that the Adamic state of human nature without original sin. Fallen human nature refers to the human nature of, you know, after Adam's sin. Christ had a Adamic, that is a pre-fallen human nature, because he was consubstantial with us in everything except for sin, because he did not have original sin, right? But the Virgin Mary fell asleep in the Lord, and she was still assumed into heaven. Um, and she gave birth to Christ in an unfallen manner. And the reason was, again, she was cleansed either at the Annunciation or when Christ was conceived, right? So this is these are the two views of the Eastern Church Fathers, at the very least, on when, you know, sin, when, when the Virgin Mary was purified, right? So either way, Christ was conceived in an unfallen manner. So uh, if you remember the debate between Jay Dyer and um, was that guy Shabir Lee or the, or the other guy? Um, not Shabir Lee. Who was that other guy? Esra Rashid or something like that. And Esra Rashid starts talking about pee pee poo poo, right? That, none of that happened because those that's a product of the fall, right? So Christ wasn't born in feces or anything like that. <laughs> That's a product of the fall, right? That mode of being born is a product of the fall. It's a product of sin. But Christ was conceived without sin, right? And the Virgin Mary was purified of sin in the Annunciation or the Conception, right? So uh, Christ was born of the Virgin Mary, but in an unfallen manner. And this is a very, very crucial detail. So you don't need Mary to be immaculately conceived for such a thing to happen, right? And the slippery slope behind immaculate conception is, well, first of all, it seems like you can immaculately conceive more than just Eve, right? You can immaculately conceive 
every other human person, for example. So it seems like the fall has turned from a kind of like a state of man to just God saying, yeah, you're falling, you're falling, you're falling. Oh, you're not going to be. You're going to be like perfect, right? That's the kind of a problem. Say John Maximum, which, for example, points out, well, that's a problem, right? Uh, we will say, for example, well, we're not God, right? We are born of our mother and father who have original sin. And so since we are born of them, we inherit that, right? So we inherit the sin of Adam, pretty much. But we don't inherit the personal sin of Adam or what, what people call inherited guilt. Some, some people will argue, for example, like me, I will argue that perhaps we inherit Adam's guilt in the sense of whenever we commit sin, we inherit the guilt of Adam because we become guilty as Adam is. Because we also know what good is, but we move towards evil, right? So, um, well, rather, I, I guess I will say, well, we know what good is, but we have deceived ourselves into thinking evil is good, right? So it's a it's a apparent good, um, which is a result of gnomic will, which is how a human person wills, right? Christ did not have a gnomic will because Christ is not a human person. He is a divine person. So he did not have a gnomic will. Um, that is, he did not see evil as apparent goods because he, as God, knew what was good and what was evil. But the Virgin Mary, as St. Sophronius of Jerusalem points out, and um, I and I want to show you. Well, this is in French, but um, this is in uh, this is in French. But I think um, give me a second. Uh, yeah, it's in, it's in French, but I think you, it's in his homily on the Annunciation and Saint Sophronius of Jerusalem, who Saint Maximus the Confessor gets his theology from pretty much makes the same exact arguments that we're making, where it says uh, in his homily on the Annunciation, um, Mary has the ability to deliberate between good and evil and the possibility of sinning, but by her own will does not. These things are unique to humans who have original sin, right? Um, so Mary still had to deliberate between good and evil, right? That's a product of the fall, right? Well, um, so, but yet she still resisted evil, right? So she was not in a state like Christ was uh, in that regard. Uh, so there is no need for the Immaculate Conception. Um, and this distinction between nature and person makes it very clear as a point that Immaculate Conception is unnecessary. Mary still died, right? She still had, she still needed to be saved. Okay, let me use a Protestant term here. But she committed no personal sin. So she was sinless, hypostatically speaking. And she was a saint, obviously. And uh, I think that kind of de gets, deals with everything that I want to talk about this video. There are some things that I have in my mind that I kind of forgot, probably. But uh, I, think, I think I covered enough. Right, I think I covered a good portion of what I wanted to cover in this video. Uh, maybe in a different stream in the future, a different video, I can get much more in depth. But this is cut. This is a good starting point. Um, I'll just check the. I'll just check the, check the live chat, or if there's any other uh, super pooper chat. Um, and all right, so. Okay, seems like I covered everything that I needed to do. Thank you all for watching. Uh, if you wanna, if you like this, like, share, subscribe as usual. Subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, let me give thanks to my Patreon financiers, my barons. Uh, thank you, Nectarius, for the super chat donation. Just wants to say that again. Uh, and thank you to. Thank you to my Patreon financiers who are Marco, Diet Soda Light, Allison, Eddie, Feder Father Justin, Nod, Maximus, Mitch, Jonathan, Stephen, Vlad, Kerry, Ignatius, Mike, Jack, Nectarius, Flooded Basement, Dave, Seraphim, and Norbert. Thank you all for supporting me. Thank you all.
who has watched this video so far. And I will see all of you.